The reading this morning is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, uh, chapter 5, verses 21 to 33. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. But this topic is actually a sensitive subject in in many ways. I know many of us in this room um, hearing this sermon have been affected by or perhaps even been through a broken marriage ourselves. And let's not disguise that. These are difficult subjects. And I want to remind ourselves that as Christians, none of us claim to be perfect. We claim to be forgiven. There's a big difference, isn't there? You know, we, we just believe that God is the one who forgives us and underneath us are the everlasting arms to pick us up when we fall and fail and to put us back on our feet. We have the Bible, which is an incredible Manual, it's God's instructions for life. I don't know how many of you have ever picked up the manual for your car and read it from cover to cover, have you? Could you put your hand up if you've done that? Oh, Ian! <laughs> well, I, I bow to you. <laughs> I don't think I've ever even picked mine up unless it's a sort of, you know, how do I change the light bulb? Um, but wow. Yes, but, but this is a book that I have read from cover to cover, and many of us in this room probably have. This is our instruction manual for life, so it's really important. But we often fail, it's the sort of template for perfection, and none of us claim to be perfect. But we know that if we, if we deviate from this, we know where to go to try and get back on the right path again. So, an important book. My brother married his wife in uh, 1986, two years before Joanne and I got married. His wife had been through a very abusive marriage before, and when they married, she already had three children. Uh, Two of them had been kidnapped and were in America at that stage, and all kinds of mess. But at the service, the, the man who officiated at the wedding, Ken Swan, down in Winchmore Hill, said this. He said, God is a specialist at redemption. And do you know what? Over the last... 34 years, 36 years, I've just witnessed them, their marriage being an incredible demonstration of amazing redemption. They had another child of their own, they adopted four more children, all broken people really, and they sort of put them together, gave them the family, then they served God in Afghanistan, and just, you just cannot imagine what God did through that couple who who started in that place of brokenness and have just been a demonstration of God's redeeming, healing power. So what I want to do is look at marriage. I want to look at sort of really from the big picture. Uh, So I want to look at sort of God's uh, reasons for, for creating us. Why did he make us in the first place? And then kind of focus down on, on God's building blocks for society. I want to talk a little bit about the devil's attack 
uh, counterattack on God's plans. And then I want to look, if you like, being a medic, talking about the anatomy and physiology of a good biblical marriage. So that's where we're going today. Um, let me just turn this on. So I love this. <clears throat> I love this cartoon. Mom, what is the meaning of life? This little boy, I was asking his mother. The answer comes back, you are. And I think that's so profound and so true. You are. You see, God is love. Uh, I imagine a time in eternity past when God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were kind of with each other. And they were just saying, I love you so much. I'm exploding with love. Yes, I am as well. What should we do? Why don't we create more children? I mean, after all, I am a father. You know, as we've already said, Jesus calls himself uh, the everlasting father. You know, they have this fatherhood in them. Let's create more children. And we'll give them free will. We don't want to create automatons. We want to give them free will so that they can choose to be loved by us or choose to reject us. It was a risky strategy, but they went ahead and did it. And Jesus, right at that moment, volunteered to be a rescue plan. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. So that's God's plan. Uh, He made us in his own image. And the fact is that God is such a tender father. When I was eight years old, I was sent away. My parents were living in Germany. I was sent away to uh, Dartmoor to, to a boarding school at the age of eight. My, my headmaster became my father figure, and I can tell you, he was a disciplinarian. He had a cane in his office, which he enjoyed using, and he did frequently. So I was in fear of this man, and he was actually my father figure. Um, and uh, my dad was in the army, off and away for four, six months at a time, quite remote for many parts of my growing up. So when I became a Christian and I realized that God was my father, in some ways it didn't exactly fill me with delight, you know, that I hadn't had the best of role models uh, when it came to fatherhood. Um, But then I came across this book here. And do you know what? There are some scriptures in this book here that are like a fine wine. I'm, I'm not a wine connoisseur, but when I see wine connoisseurs pick up a glass of wine, a big one, you know what I mean, and they pour in a little splash of red wine, and they sort of they taste it, and they kind of look at the color of it, don't they? They swish it around the glass, and then, then, they, then they smell it, and then they, they don't even swallow it. They just sort of rub it around their mouth. I think it's the south side of the vineyard. You know, whatever it is. I think it's red. <laughs> but, uh, and then they, then they drink it. But I'm like that with some scriptures. I am like that with some scriptures. And one of them is Ephesians 2, 4, which goes like this. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, smell this, because of his great love for us, God, who's rich in mercy, made us alive when we were dead in our sins. And God raised us up and seated us with Christ in heavenly places in order that in the coming ages he might demonstrate the incomparable riches of his grace in his kindness to us. Can you just sort of savor these scriptures? You know, I literally spend a little bit every single day of my life just going through one or two of these scriptures. Titus 3, 4 is another one. When the, when the kindness and love of God appeared, he saved us, not because of any righteous deeds we had done, but because of his great mercy. And so it goes on. So you need to spend time in these scriptures, just kind of feeling the, the, you know, the scent and the taste and the odor of God's great love for us. So he's not an old angry old man with a stick the headmaster with his, with, his, with his cane, ready to beat us. He wants to love us. When I look at my son with his two daughters, I see the model of good fatherhood, the patience, the kindness, the sweetness, the love, the tenderness, picking them up when they fall. And so it, this is, just reminds me, he's a reflection of God. Uh, it's so important. So this is the love of God. Many of you know Uh, This book here was written in 2002 by Rick Warren. Uh, By 2020, it had sold 50 million copies and been translated into 85 different languages. It spent 90 weeks in the New York bestsellers list. Everyone wants to know, what's my purpose in life? But let me ask you, what's God's purpose? Yeah, that's an interesting question, isn't it? What is God's purpose? Is Is it written down anywhere? Is there a book? Well, as it happens, yes. (laughs) Ephesians 2 also. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity, for he himself is our peace, 
who has destroyed the barrier of hostility between us and God, between us and each other. He destroyed and demolished that barrier of hostility, making peace through the cross. Consequently, you are members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus is the chief cornerstone, a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This is the purpose of God, to create in himself one new humanity. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. And when angels and demons look at the church, they say, that cannot be denied. That is the wisdom of God. When people who are under the influence of angels and demons look at the church, look at Beacon or St. Altman's or St. George's or St. John's, the intention is they'll look at that church and think that undisputably is the wisdom of God. Look at the way they love each other. Different nations, different social classes, different ages coming together as one just to serve and love each other, this town and their God. And that is the wisdom of God. And the building blocks of this new humanity, as Mike read out, is the church. So here we go. uh, Sorry, is the family. So we come down to the building blocks of this, of this church, this temple, it's families, families. This is it. Pretend. <laughs> the family is the building block for whatever solidarity there is in society. That was William Ruckelhaus and uh, Billy Graham. When the family is destroyed, society eventually disintegrates, and we'll come back to that later. So let's just have a quick look at what Mike read out. Submit one to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, his body, of which he is a saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Two things I'll say about that. One is... Wives, if you're feeling a bit hard done by, you know, I've got to submit to my husbands. If you're feeling, oh, well, actually, look at verse 21. Submit to one another. He has got to submit to you. So you can just, if your husband's ever sort of being a bit domineering and ordering you about, you know, just pull out Ephesians 5, 21. Hey, submit to me, mate. <laughs> it's right there in Scripture. <laughs> we are supposed to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. The other big thing about this, isn't it, is that when people look at a married couple, they're supposed to say, you know what, the way he loves her is actually a picture of Christ loving the church, giving himself up for her, sacrificing himself for her. And the way she loves him is actually the way the church responds to Christ and loves him in return. So we are a picture of the kingdom of heaven. Now, here's the bad news. Not surprisingly, there is an attack on marriage. Satan does not like the kingdom of heaven being demonstrated through marriages at all. Now, the battle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, and powers in this dark age, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly realms. We have one who is seeking to destroy marriage. And this is the marriage rates in England and Wales. And that is the moment that Joanne and I got married in 1988. And believe it or not, since 1988, the rate of marriage has more than halved, which is incredible. And let's just have a quick look at these statistics. Marriage rates in 2018 were the lowest on record. Recent Chloe's wedding, am I right in saying this, was the first they've had in St. Altman since the lockdown. So, so, you know, it's not common. It's not common. But, you know, what a blessing that Reese and Chloe just demonstrated. This is godly living to our town. And the, the bells rang out. They should have been morning bells, but they were bells of joy. Um, almost 90% of men born in 1948 were married. By the age of 40, now only about 50% of the population over 16 are unmarried or in a civil partnership. In 2014, same-sex marriage was legalized. Four years later, 7,000 marriages in the UK, one in 35 was same-sex. 21% of opposite-sex marriages in 2018 were religious ceremonies, the lowest on record. 0.9% of same-sex marriages were religious ceremonies. And a third of all marriages end in divorce. What is the effect of... um, What is the effect 
of this sort of demolition of marriage in our society? What, what effect has it had? I was staggered by this um, survey done by George Barner's team last year, published in less than a year ago, October 21, in America. And uh, these are the effects. A majority of uh, 20, 25 to 40-year-olds, these are called these millennials, uh, 25 to 40, about a third of the population of America fall into this category, millennials. A majority admit to feeling anxious and depressed. Most <coughs> reject the existence of an absolute moral truth. Three quarters say they're still searching for their purpose in life. Three quarters. 30% describe themselves as LGBTQ. 30% of 18 to 25, so that's even younger than this group, had mental illness. 50% of 13 to 18-year-olds had one or more types of mental illness. That, that's 13 to 18, that's school children. 50% of them had mental illness. 8.6 had severe mental illness. That's in America. Well, thank goodness, these statistics are nowhere near that bad in the UK. 93.6% of our nation in the 2020s said they were heterosexual, straight, and just looking at the younger group, 16 to 24 is 88%, sorry, 8% identified as LGBTQ. But let's just bear in mind that saying, when America sneezes, the rest of the world catches a cold. That actually dates from the Napoleonic era, that, that expression, which I was amazed by. But anyway, let's be aware that the, America is pumping out Hollywood, Netflix, everything you watch, most of the internet, it's all coming from this society that is so broken and so damaged and pumping out uh, this pollution into society. And no wonder people are getting poisoned by it. So what does the Bible say? This is the key thing. Let's go back to the maker's instructions. Ian, how many, how many, I won't ask you how many times you've read this one. You must read it every day. Um, two purposes. For marriage, firstly, companionship. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. And the other purpose is for procreation. God blessed him and said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Genesis 1 and 2. And Genesis 2 also says this. Three instructions. Leave, cleave, and become one. We're going to look at those. Leave, cleave, and become one. A man leaves his father and mother, and he's united to his wife, and they become one. One flesh, Genesis 2, quoted by Jesus in Matthew 19 and by Paul in the passage we've just read. Just as an overview before we delve into those three, I just want to point out two things. Opposite sex and monogamy. Interesting, isn't it? That's opposite sex and just one husband, one wife. Now, in the Bible, we notice, don't we, that Abraham actually had two wives and a concubine. He had Hagar and Sarah and Keturah. So what's going on there? But look at their children. 4,000 years or so later, Ishmael and Isaac, Arabs and Jews, are still fighting. Let's look at Solomon, who had 300 wives and 700 concubines. Immediately he died, Israel split into two, and 3,000 years later has never been reconciled. This is not God's ideal plan. This is not in his instruction manual. It's one partner for life, one faithful partner for life. Two reasons for divorce in scripture are given. Uh, Jesus said this because by the time Jesus came along, divorce was actually pretty common. You could kind of uh, marry, divorce your wife if she burnt the toast, that kind of thing. But anyway, so Jesus had to set the record straight. And he said this, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Paul then added this in 1 Corinthians 7.15, if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. In other words, what he's saying, if, if you've got a, 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 part, a couple, one becomes, becomes a Christian, the other says, I can't live with you. You know, you're just a Christian fanatic now. Then that person is free to leave, is free to leave that Christian spouse. And in that case, the, the Christian spouse is free to remarry. So that's the situation. It goes without saying. Paul says this, 2 Corinthians 6.14, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do the righteous and wickedness have in common, or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Do not assume, young people, that the person you're going out with, oh, they'll become a Christian, I'm sure. You know, that's, uh, that's not necessarily true. 
When I was a, a medical student, there was a saying which was a very, very valuable saying that I've always kept at the top of my thinking, and that is uh, that if you assume things, it will inevitably make an ass of you. So never assume anything. It will make an ass of you. Do not go into marriage with a non-Christian thinking they will eventually become a Christian. It will make an ass of you. So that's a warning from Scripture. But here we go. Three instructions. Leave, cleave, and become one. A man leaves his father and mother. I love this film, don't you? Have you ever seen it? Um, Father of the Bride, Steve Martin, has enormous difficulty in letting go of his daughter. And I think that's very common. Um, Really, all I can think to say about this is to go back to the brick. You know, I felt a tremendous wrench in my heart when each one of my five kids left home. I felt like this brick was kind of, you know, becoming slightly smaller. Still fitting, but, but just becoming a little bit smaller. Uh, and I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure that Ian and Sharon and Ian uh, and, and Barbara will know the feeling. Your, your whole life has changed. Something has shifted. There's been a sort of shift in the tectonic plates of how you live. But the great thing is that they've, they've formed another brick. There's another stable brick for society. Because you have to extrapolate, don't you? People who leave home and just cohabit, they're not forming a solid unit. They're just, sort of, they're just doing damage to society. Do you understand that? If you extrapolate this, they're not forming another solid brick for society. This is not going to be sustainable in the long term, according to Billy Graham and others. So the basic unit of, uh, of society is that, is, the, is a, a stable marriage. Cleave, united to his wife. Now, Cleave, Eric, what does Cleven mean? Cleven, uh, well. Cle- Cle- I think it means st- stick or cle- oh, Cleven. Cleven. Yeah, sorry. What does it mean? It's your German, I don't get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cleven means to stick. Stick. Cleave comes from Kleben. <laughs> Kleben. So I've stuck these two bits of paper together. Can you see there? Two bits of paper stuck together. What I'm going to do now, before your very eyes, I'm going to rip these in two. Let's see if it just rips neatly down the sellotape line. It's ripped. It's ripped the paper. Yes, it, there's been damage not just to the glue, but to actual to the paper. When you rip, when you when you rip something that's been cleaved together, it's actually people that get, get damaged, not the marriage, um, marriage contract that gets damaged. It's the people that get, get damaged as well. So what does the word cleave actually mean? What is this, what is this sellotape? Sellotape in this illustration is true biblical love. And actually, do you know the glorious thing about sellotape? It's something that you can control very accurately. Something you can control. You tell exactly how much you take off. Now, can you control emotions? You can't, can you? Can you control physical desire? You can't. It's not under your control. But can you control your will? Yes, you can. So this is biblical marital love. Something that you can control. Now notice in Deuteronomy 6, God says to the people of Israel, I command you, love the Lord your God. How can he command it if it's just an emotion? He can't. He's talking to the will. Jesus said in John 15, love one another. A new commandment I give to you, love one another. It's it's not emotion. He's talking about the will. People say, don't they, I I can't come to church today. I'm in a bad place. Are they right to say that? I can't come to church, I'm in a bad place. I don't think they're right to say that because they're talking about their emotions and Jesus never addressed the emotions. He addressed the will. He commanded us to love one another. No matter what our emotions are doing, that is a command. Now we have to understand something about the human. This is the anatomy of a human being. We're tripartite beings. We have a body, we live in a body. We have a soul, which we have. I have a soul, but we are spirit. And the soul consists of mind, will, and emotions. So what we're talking about here is this. We're talking about love that comes from the will, from nowhere else, not from the body. Now, 
the three types of love, uh, Greek words for love, eros, which is lust, physical lust. We're talking about philia, which is an emotional love, brotherly affection. And then we're talking about the God kind of love, agape, agape love, which is, the, is centered in the will. Judy did a brilliant sermon yesterday. Absolutely brilliant. Do you remember what she said? She said, what one word would describe Reese and Chloe? Reckless. Reckless. She said, why, why did she say that? Why, why did she say reckless? Because she said they just made this vow that they will love one another in sickness and in health till death us do part. That was something they vowed recklessly. They vowed that. So they were right. They were they right to make this reckless vow. They could do because it was founded not on their emotions, not in their physical, their emotions change, physical desires change, but the will is something constant that you can promise till death us do part. And they did it beautifully. So cleave is something that you founded in the will. And then we come on to one flesh. One flesh. Sex. <laughs> so sex, I believe, is just... Notice that sex was not a result of the fall. Sex was before the fall. So actually sex is something ordained by God. And in English, we call it consummation of a marriage. What does consummation mean? Con means with or together. Summation means completeness. So what we're talking about sex is actually something that is the finishing touches. Once you've looked after the leaving of your parents, the sort of responsibility for society. Once you've looked after cleaving, you've made that vow, that covenant contract before God, then the sex can come. And that is the right place for it. So um, I believe that Christians enjoy the best sex in the world <laughs> because it's absolutely as God intended sex to be. And that's just um, that's the way it is. Now, one, two things I will say before I finish. One is that although we're married to our loving partners and, and I love Joanne with all my heart and with all my soul, I enjoy being with her. She's my lover, my best friend, and I can't imagine life without her. Actually, when we get to heaven, we find out this was just a dress rehearsal for the real marriage which comes in heaven. In fact, in Isaiah 54 verse 5, uh, uh, the, the prophet Isaiah said, your maker is your husband. And Paul in 2 Corinthians 11 says this, he says, I betroth you to Christ. So all the way through the Bible, you get this feeling that there is actually something more. And then in Revelations, we finally find out it's the marriage supper of the Lamb when each one of us is married to Jesus. Jesus will come back for his bride, the church. And it says, in the passage that Mike just read out, it said, without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and perfect. So this is what we've got to be to Jesus for him to come back to. The other point is that um, in 1934, and this is coming back to Billy Graham's point, a guy called J.D. Unwin wrote a book called Sex and Culture. And in his book, he said this, a scholar named J.D. Edwin studied 86 different cultures. He found that the people group rose to political power and influence when their sexual morality matched that promoted in the Bible, absolute monogamy. So prenuptial chastity coupled with absolute monogamy. Unwin found, with no exceptions to the latter rule, that within three generations uh, of them leaving those two founding principles, then those civilizations collapsed. We are now three generations from the 1960s when the permissive society came in, when free sex started coming in, when people started abandoning prenuptial chastity and absolute monogamy. So we are now in a disintegrating culture, as we've just seen from that Barna report. Church, what is the answer to this for society? We are the medicine for this. We are the demonstration of the body of Christ. We are the living Bible. We must, as never before, be salt and light in our community. 
Jesus said, didn't he, what good is salt if it loses its saltiness? It's fit just to be thrown on the rubbish heap. Let's not veer one iota, one letter from this instruction manual to life. We need to be salt in our, in our society and civilization, or otherwise civilization in the West will continue to disintegrate and crumble. We want it to be there for our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. So let's live out the word of Christ, the word of truth, not be ashamed of it, not dilute it, not compromise it. Let's live it out, be bold, be proud, if necessary, be confrontational, but let's be an example for godly living to our society. And let's be a radiant church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless, so that Christ will want to come back for his church. So Father, we just thank you for your living word. Thank you for Reese and Chloe. Thank you for that godly expression of what is on your heart in this book. Lord, we just pray that each one of us will live to your glory, Lord, and stand on the word of truth, Lord, and present this word, not only, Lord, uh, through our mouths, but through our lives. We just pray that we would be living epistles in this church and individually and as couples in Jesus' name. Amen.